Hello, and welcome to a special edition of Questions with Jeff Edelman. I'm your host, and I'm here because we have another special election coming up in Coral Springs on June 18th, and I wanted to introduce all of you to my friend, Coram Wahid. How are you doing, Coram? Good. Thanks, Thanks so much for being here with us. I mean, with a local election, there's not a lot of opportunity for people to meet the candidates. So I wanted to provide you that opportunity to talk about the issues that are important to you and a little bit about who you are as a candidate and as a human being too. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I, I appreciate everyone who I've been talking to as I go around the city. Uh, we did a, a meet and greet the other night and a lot of folks came out. So I'm really enjoying the interaction I'm having with folks. Uh, and I, I, I think the idea of getting the word out this way is great. Well, thank you. Um, well, let me ask you this to start. Uh, tell us what motivates you to throw your hat in the ring in this race for that Coral Springs commission seat vacated by Dan Daly. You know, I've been involved in uh, public service really my entire life. You know, when I was young, I, I got involved with starting a Big Brothers program for refugee kids in the city I grew up in. Um, and my entire life, I've wanted to make sure that we're doing things that, you know, when all is said and done and your life is over, you've left the world a better place than when you came in. To me, I've done that through the process of community work, working with nonprofits, working in the area of either mentoring or diversity or working on uh, small business uh, mentoring. I have felt that I could do more than I'm doing. And this opportunity is that for me, a chance to do more for more people. If if I can do what I'm doing right now in the nonprofit world and on boards that I'm part of, but if I could do that for the people of Coral Springs, I will have felt like I have accomplished something. What are your priorities if you're elected to this seat as a Coral Springs commissioner? So look, I, I came here um, you know, in 99 because I had a young family and we were looking for a great place to live. And this was the best place in Broward County to live and probably in the state of Florida. At that time, I had a three-year-old and we'd go to parks. We found that the parks were awesome. There were so many parks to choose from. We would go to Betty Stradling Park for the most part. Um, my concern these days is that Betty Stradling looks the same as it did in 1999. A lot of our parks have aged. Uh, we have to really figure out how to get young families to come to the city. Young families come for two reasons, the schools and the open spaces. If we can drive young families here, we'll increase demand. And increasing demand in Coral Springs is a good thing for a bunch of reasons. I wanna make sure that we improve the parks. I wanna improve safety for our officers and transparency in government by having body cameras on our law enforcement. I want us to look at economic development as helping our small businesses do better, bringing more attention to them and helping them be the engine that drives this city's economy, which is what they've been in my mind for the last 20 years I've been around. I wanna work on infrastructure. Our city is aging. It's starting to look that way and underground, it's 60 years old. We have to start working with the county and with our state to look at this and start planning and have a vision for redevelopment underground and beautifying our city. And finally, I think we have to do a better job of connecting the different communities that are Coral Springs. Uh, we're a very diverse town, the demographics are changing, and we have to do a better job of getting everyone's voice in the mix, reaching out to everybody, building the bridges that are needed to, I think, fix some of the problems. We can do this together, but if we're in our separate silos, I think this is gonna be a, a much more difficult challenge. So I feel I can bridge these gaps and bring different folks together to find us a collective solution to some of our problems. What are some of your ideas for economic development for the city? I'd like to see us focus on small business. Uh, we have many small businesses that are struggling merely because of some of the code issues. Our city is not as code friendly as it could be. Uh, it's always we, been like that. Yeah. yeah, we need to work on that. The, the reputation of Coral Springs is not that we are a business friendly city. Uh, we have to change that reputation. And we can do that through some code changes by making signage uh, while still uniform and not overly ostentatious but easier for folks to find the businesses they're looking for, easier for businesses to sell themselves. We need to look also at the idea of 
what are we doing with our industrial park, our corporate park? Some of the coding that we do there is driving those businesses away. Half a dozen businesses will come in and then half a dozen businesses will go out. So we have to figure out and assess why are they leaving? It's some of its coding. If you're driving down Coral Ridge and you see a truck in the area where trucks are supposed to be in a warehouse district, you're gonna get fined for that truck being visible from the road. That's not business friendly. So we have to think through some of these code issues. Finally, I really want us to do a better job of looking at bringing the right types of businesses to Coral Springs. Technology businesses, young people, right. people who will create high paying jobs. We don't need a job creator that creates 100,000 jobs at minimum wage. We need good, high paying, good technology jobs. One of the businesses I do, in addition to my law firm, is a company called Innovator, I-N-V-8-R. And uh, cool name, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so what we do is we find uh, you know, people who are grad students and professors in engineering and innovation technology around the country, and we have a network. I have contracts with Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security, and we connect these folks together to help them commercialize their great ideas. So the government gets a great idea, a great technology solution exclusively for five years. And in return, they help build the business of these individuals. And I have about three of those clients right now that are in Coral Springs. Those are going to be high paying jobs down the road. So those are companies that actually do business with the Department of Defense and, and other Department branches of, of uh, the government? Absolutely, so they create a product that the department needs. Let's say the Department of Homeland Security or DOD says, I need a solution to see through clouds. And we look through our network and there's someone who's working on something that might fit that. We put the two pieces together and if it looks like it's gonna work out, we create the contract vehicle to do that and we help shepherd that business through the process of commercializing their product. That's something that helps both the taxpayer who gets a great product and the business who gets to still own all of their business. Unlike if it's a venture capital company that comes in, buys 51% of your company. Right. Now, you have a little bit of a different legal background than me, a different path. Uh, you didn't go right to law school. That's right. Uh, from college. Uh, you want to tell uh, the viewers a little bit about what you did that four year period before starting law school? Sure, I did a couple of things actually. One of them was um, I got involved with um, uh, basically starting a computer training school. I worked uh, in the area, I started working in the area as a telecommunications manager and the, one, of the, one of the owners of the business uh, found I had a high skill set in the technology area and so together we started a computer training school. Um, after a few years, we managed to get uh, three um, chapters going. We worked with the uh, government. We got a contract for retraining of people who were unemployed to help them segue. You know, this is in the, the, the early mid 90s, help them segue from non-technology to technology type jobs. And uh, eventually I decided to sell that business and go to law school. So that's how you paid for law school. That's how I paid for law school. <laughs> that's right. And... Um, you know, would you um, tell us a little bit about your your law firm and your practice? Sure. Um, uh, Wahid Vizcaino, we do criminal and civil litigation as well as family law. My law partner, Carmen Vizcaino, uh, Cuban-American, uh, born and raised in Miami. Uh, so we have a Miami office and a Broward office. Uh, I have been myself focused on criminal defense for almost my entire career. I also do the civil litigation side of things. Uh, I started out as a public defender in Miami-Dade County. And then I moved on to be a public defender in Harlem. I, I did that because I really believe that everyone deserves a defense. I don't care if you have money or not, you deserve the best defense, a zealous advocate. A lot of folks um, you know, that I've represented over the years uh, have been in the areas of white collar crimes, but we also have done a lot of uh, you know, violent crimes in the past, we've done uh, national security cases, sure. uh, and we've done a lot of cases related to what um, are now not even crimes anymore. So, you know, uh, things like, you know, ma marijuana is starting to become more and more accepted uh, as time goes on. So uh, we've also d been involved with some advocacy work uh, in the law firm, and I've done some government affairs work through that, mostly representing nonprofits. You know, you mentioned that, you know, you do criminal defense and I have quite a few close friends that also do criminal uh, defense. Um, some people have trouble. Like, how how do you represent people who 
you think might be guilty of the crime that they committed. How, how do you separate that from what you do, Curran? Sure. That's a pretty common question, as you know, that, uh, you know, you ask the first thing folks ask a criminal defense lawyer is, I could never do that. How do you represent mm -hmm. guilty people? Uh, my response is, uh, it's this piece of paper that uh, we commonly call the United States Constitution. You know, everybody um, flies a flag. For me, the flag is a representation of something. Uh, and it's not just the 50 stars representing 50 states. These stars represent the commonality of the 50 states. And what's that commonality is the United States Constitution. These are the values upon which America is built. This is the bedrock of our society. And those are embodied in the Constitution. We have these constitutional values such as no one in the government is gonna tell you what to think, what to say. That's the First Amendment. No one is going to tell you that we can, as a government, go in and take your property and search your home. That's the Fourth Amendment. No one's going to in the government be able to say, you know what, you don't get uh, any process here. We're going to do something and you don't have a say in it. You don't have any representation. That's the Fifth Amendment. The Sixth Amendment is critical. And that is that if the government accuses you of a crime and they say, we are going to charge you with that crime, but the Sixth Amendment says you have a right to defend yourself because it's only an accusation. You are innocent until proven guilty. Innocent until proven guilty is why defense lawyers exist. That's what I believe I do. I stand up for the Constitution every day, and I am proud of it. And I feel like me and the brethren of the criminal defense bar, we are the last line of defense for that Sixth Amendment. And if it is but for us, that amendment is, is void. It means nothing. It's just writing on a piece of paper. We are the embodiment of that. And truthfully, if the state or the government brings a case, they should have to prove it. And that's really what your job is. You got to prove it. And if you prove it, then you get the conviction. But if you don't have all the facts, then that, that's not that's not justified. Absolutely. And there and there's, you know, people are found not guilty. Why? Because the government didn't have enough evidence to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. These are standards that make sure that and it has been said over and over again that an, it is better that 10 guilty go free than one innocent man go to jail. And I really believe that. Absolutely. Well, you know, Karam, you and I have gotten to talking about, you grew up in Toronto. I did. And uh, it's one of my favorite cities, uh, to be honest with you. And I know it's a very multicultural city. Absolutely. Um, how did being raised in Toronto shape your worldview? So, you know, we, we grew up, uh, I, I, and I grew up in the seventies, uh, when it started, uh, you know, my journey, uh, through school, um, it was mostly a, a very, um, Anglo society. It wasn't that multicultural. Um, so I had to deal with the, the impact of that, which, you know, there were definitely times and we went through some phases of, you know, where, uh, being a minority, you definitely have felt a little on the outside, a little on the outcast side. And I think that was helpful for me to have walked those shoes. So I can relate to that moment uh, as Toronto changed. Toronto changed because people started coming from all over the world. Mm -hmm. And as that happened, we really got um, great cultural diversity. I believe that um, we are stronger through the diversity that we have. That, you know, this is not just restaurants. It's also the, the culture that comes with those things. And that's what makes uh, our country so great. There are people who I know and friendships I've made who are people who've taught me about what it's like to live in Morocco or Brazil or places that I haven't traveled to, but I now know more about. And I realize the common thread between all the societies around the world. And that is our children, that is our families. And that's honestly the common thread upon which I'm really saying that um, we need to focus here on Coral Springs. Well, Kurum, looking at your background prior to entering this race, I, I think it that community service and doing for others has always been at the core of who you are. Um, some of the things that speak speak to me uh, are you won Humanitarian of the Year by the MCCJ Miami and the Florida Bar's Latimer uh, Service Award. Can you talk a little bit about community service and how, the, how important that is to you? 
So, yeah. Uh, you know, look, I, it comes down to this. Uh, if we are going to um, try, if we want our families to have an opportunity to be better people, we want our children to be better people. We have to lead by example. I think it's important that we do this if, with every capacity we have access to. When I was younger, I was involved with uh, some international development and I would go overseas and mm -hmm. look at these international development projects and give feedback on where uh, that charity should put its money. I remember one time I saw, um, I was sitting there and it was in a, uh, there was a, a river that was in front of me and all the kids were playing in it. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. Then I realized the day before that was the sewage ditch and that's what they're playing in. And one of the oh reasons we were in that city is we found that the mortality rate of children, of infants was so high in that area. And we realized this is it. And I'm looking at it as I'm drinking tea and I'm like, this is the fix. And so we paved it over, we put in an underground tube um, and that dropped the mortality, mortality rate by over 50% wow. over three years. So there's every little thing we do can have a great impact. Um, I'm a big fan of mentoring. I believe in leadership development. If we don't lift up the next generation and have them be trained to lift up the next generation, we are doing our entire society an injustice. I'm uh, on the board of um, the Florida Bars Leadership Academy, uh, one of the things that I've been championing for a long time. Uh, I'm part of the Kozak Minority Mentoring Foundation, which is mentoring young people of different backgrounds. I'm also somebody who's been very involved through other leadership projects locally here in, in Broward County. I was one of the founding members of Voices for Children here in Broward. Um, so these are all things that I believe are important for us to build bridges, to help lift up others, create a pipeline of leadership. These are all important for our society. And we can't just think of these as these are nice to do. For me, they are mandatory things to do. And that kind of dovetails into some of your uh, issues in Coral Springs. I know that uh, play areas for children are very important to you. Uh, you were telling a story about your daughter coming back to one of the parks and saying, it looks exactly the same as it did 20 years ago. Exactly, yeah, 99 when we first came here, we went to Betty Straddling Park. And uh, then recently we went back there and we were hanging out with now my niece's daughter, who's like three. And I was telling my daughter, when you were three years old, I brought you here. And I said, other than the tin roof though, it looks just the same as it did in 1999. Um, we have to make this a family friendly city. That means we have to do things to attract young people. We should be investing in public private partnerships for these parks, uh, bring in some resources to make get water parks in town, modernize some of the parks, make them safe again. Our community, needs to have young people moving into it. Young people moving into this city are, is good for everybody. It helps make sure that the demand for Coral Springs goes up. As demand goes up, we're going to make sure that housing prices go up. Housing prices going up means our ad valorem tax, which is the basis of our city revenue, will go higher. And in the end of the day, I don't have to tax you a citizen as much because I'm getting that revenue. And you can sell your house for what should be a reasonable price because it's the proper value. Demand. We, we shouldn't be thinking only of, oh, we're going to fix our economic problems by cutting spending. We really have to have a vision as opposed to uh, an approach that is simply bookkeeping. Our approach has to be, we're going to expand the demand. We're going to raise the bar. We're going to be the best city in Florida once again. And that kind of goes with also the schools kind of giving some of the schools a facelift. Absolutely. I know we had talked about uh, my son, Ben, goes to Coral Springs Middle School. Yeah. And while I am proud that they won National School of the Year in 1990 or 91. 91 yeah, it's written uh, on the side of their building. I, I, I was a, uh, a freshman in high school at Coral Springs High at that point. So it's, right. been, it's been a little while. Yeah, for and, sure. Uh, so uh, look, I think if you talk to your real estate folks in town, they're going to say that when they're driving prospective families around to sell them Coral Springs, they try to avoid these corners as opposed mm -hmm. to take them there as a destination point. People come here for the schools and the parks and the open spaces. Um, if our schools aren't doing great, we need to work with our county to fix that. If our schools are aesthetically a deterrent as opposed to an attractor, we need to address that. These are all part and parcel to how do we sell the city and make the demand go up. You know, I've also discovered through knowing you that we know some of the same people in a 
small community. Yeah. The hockey community. Hockey. That's right. Okay. Um, I'm sorry about the Leafs. I My Blackhawks didn't even make it they into didn't the make show. It. So yeah. I don't know which is. is worse. I'll be honest with you. I, I, I would almost rather feel like, don't give me the hope. Don't don't tease me like that. Well, there is hope. It took 49 years for the Hawks to win in 2010. Right. There's always hope for Toronto. Well, the last time the Leafs won the Stanley Cup is the year I was born, 1968. <laughs> so it's been a bit. It's been, been a, a little bit. while. To say they're due is an understatement. Correct. But um, it's not just that you're a fan. You actually play. I do. Uh, where do you Where do you currently play hockey? So uh, I've been playing my whole life, obviously, you know, Canadian. Um, so it's a, it's a religion almost over there. Mm -hmm. Um, I play right now in, in Pines and we play up here at the Coral Springs arena. Um, our, my more regular game is down in Pines and it's, it's been going on since 1999. And you're not a forward. You're not a defenseman. What position do you play? I'm a goaltender. You know, people take shots at me all day long. That's okay. <laughs> I could take it. <laughs> and they say the goaltenders are a different breed. I think that's true. So I think there's truth to that. You know, uh, you know, I, I'm this I'm this person who understands that, you know, when there's a game, uh, if I don't feel well, if I'm not up to it, but we've got a game set as the goaltender. If I pull out, there's no game. So everyone is relying on me. And for me, rain or shine, it doesn't matter how I feel, I'm gonna be there for them because the team comes first. And so I show up. Seems like your experience as a goalie kind of is how you live your life too. I, I think so. You know, I, I think that you have a responsibility greater than yourself, even in the little moments of playing a hockey game. Karim, we're almost done, and I've really appreciated this conversation. We've had a lot of fun on here. Um, what would you say to anybody watching this and says, Another election. <laughs> we just had an election for mayor. We just had the governor's election, yeah. June eighteenth. Why should I even participate? So you know, you, if you watched the news recently, you saw what's going on in Venezuela. Um, they're fighting for the right to pick their own government, to pick their own leadership. You know, democracy is a messy thing, um, and it takes work. It takes work from all of us as citizens, and part of that is participating in it. It doesn't work otherwise. It doesn't have the same effect for you. So people around the world are fighting for the opportunity we have, which is free and fair democracy, being able to vote and pick our own leadership. Think of it like this. If you could pick your own boss and that boss is gonna be able to dictate when you come to work and when you don't, dictates how much money you're gonna make, dictates vacation time for you, dictates the office you have or the cubicle you have, and someone said, I'm going to give you a choice to pick your own boss. Would you not take that choice? You put it that way, it's actually. <laughs> that's pretty much what yeah, government is about. Yeah, that's um, about as clear as it gets. Um, now, on June 18th, there is no, there's no early voting or anything like that. But if somebody's going to be out of town or they just don't feel like going to the polls that day, yeah. how can they vote from home? Yeah, vote by mail. And I recommend folks do this because June 18th, Kids are out of school. You might be on vacation and you might even not remember what day of the week it is. If you're having a good vacation, hopefully you won't remember what day of the week it is. So you can vote by mail. Go to BrowardSOE.org. Click the vote by mail button and request your ballot. It should get mailed to your house the week of May 13th, uh, somewhere in there. I'm just posting it up there for people so they can see that. Right. Um, well, in any event, you know, I think that we've covered a lot of ground, Kurum. Uh, Is there anything else that you would like to uh, tell the viewers out there, tell the listeners about yourself and why they should make the effort to check off Kurum Wahid on June 18th? So I, I think that when we talk about putting families first, we have to figure out why we're we doing that. We're doing that because, you know, a city is really a community of communities. And Coral Springs is no different. And the through line between all these communities is the laughter of our children and their safety. That's something we can all agree on and we need to work together to do that. I wanna make sure that we improve our parks and bring demand up in the city. I wanna make sure that we put body cameras on our law enforcement for their protection and for transparency in government. I wanna make sure we're building the infrastructure of the city so that our children aren't left with a poor legacy in the next generation. And I want us to focus on small business because that's truly the economic engine of this city. 
they feed their families and all those who work for them. I think together, and it has to be together, we can listen to each other, build bridges, and find a way to really solve our problems together. This is something that isn't a would-be nice moment. We're in a moment where we have to do it. We have to do it because it's important for the next generation. And that's why I'm running for Coral Springs City Commissioner. Karim, great talking with you. Thanks so much, Jeff. Uh, Karim Wahid, uh, my name is Jeff Edelman. You can see right here on the screen. If you want more information, go to electwahid.com uh, for more information. And if you have any questions for Karim, uh, he's available to talk or anything like that. He's very accessible, I can tell you that. Yeah. Uh, and for those of you who are watching or listening, appreciate you giving us the time. Thanks for being here. Thanks. If you go to our Facebook page, you can see a lot of our content and videos, and you can learn a lot more about the positions we just talked about. And they can learn how to pronounce your name correctly yeah, yeah, have and, see how people, and see how people pronounce it incorrectly. Yes, I really like that one. That was a fun video to do. <laughs> that was a fun video. All right. Thanks so much, Jeff. Thank, really appreciate it. Thank you, Karim. Thanks, everybody.